for me Good morning, everybody. Um, if you do not know me, my name is Emma. I work with the youth here at Encounter. It's so great to be with you all this morning um, to worship Jesus together. If it's your first time here, we want to say a special welcome. We're so glad that you are here. And on your way out, I encourage you to stop at our Welcome Center, which if you got these back doors into the right, you'll see it. Um, we have a welcome team there. They would love to say hi, um, give you a, a small gift. And then while you're there, you can also fill out something we have called a Connect Card. And with that, you can give us any contact information if you choose to do that. And we can just stay in touch with you, keep you up to date on what's happening here at Encounter. Um, if it's more convenient, you can also do that online with our free Encounter Church app. 
Um, but either way, we're so glad that you're here this morning, so thank you for joining us. Um, and I have a good bit of announcements this morning, so bear with me. And if you're going to tune me out, at least look at the screen and follow along with the slides. <laughs> so first, um, we have growth groups. They're starting um, February 4th. If you were here last week, you saw the big growth groups fair. Um, there's a table out there again. There's booklets, and that will have all of the different growth groups available. So these are groups you can join, um, build community, um, study the Bible, do all sorts of things. Um, so if you're looking to get involved, this is a great way. Um, my next announcement, um, the quarter quarterly Connect lunch is coming up. If you're new to Encounter or you've come here for years, but you still feel like you don't know many people, um, I encourage you to come to this on January 21st, 12 to 1.30. You'll get to meet some other people at Encounter. You'll meet the staff. Um, and if you're planning on coming, we just ask that you RSVP, which you can do by emailing the church office um, and RSVP by January 15th. Um, and we also have our women's retreat coming up. Um, there's some information on the screen behind me. But if you would like even more details um, or you're ready to sign up, there is going to be a table out in the lobby at the info center. You can stop there. Um, we also have our annual business meeting coming up, and that is January 23rd, 7 to 8 p.m. Um, this is just some, you know, business stuff like the budget and, uh, you know, all that. So if you're interested in that, <laughs> come, to, come to that meeting on January 23rd. Um, and then lastly, on January 17th at 6.30 here at Encounter, um, Keystone Family Alliance is going to come, and they're going to do a training um, kind of class. And so here at Encounter, if you don't know, we have a foster and adoption care group. Um, and this training is an opportunity for you. If you're looking to get involved with that group, it will train you on how to care for um, the members of our church that are in foster and adoption. Um, so yeah, if you're interested in getting involved, this is a great way to learn more and just get some training on um, that. So thank you for sticking with it. Um, if you'll stand up, I'm going to say a word of prayer before we enter our time of worship. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for every person that is standing in this room. Thank you that you've created us in your image. Um, thank you that you love us and that you care about us enough to send your son to die on the cross um, for our behalf, Lord. We're so thankful. Um, and We don't thank you enough, God. So may this time be a time to thank you, to worship you, um, remove any and all distractions from our minds so that our hearts and minds can fully focus on you, God. Um, just prepare us to hear your word. Um, and I pray that you be with um, Ted and the worship team as they get ready to lead us this morning. May everything that happens here honor you, Lord. I pray all of these things in your holy name. Amen. Good morning again, church family. Um, this week I was real ill, and I'm still, I'm still pretty ill, actually. I'm not, I'm not 100%. And I remember all these Christians when I was younger saying, oh, the, you know, it's such a blessing. It's such a gift when the Lord gets you out of your bed. And I, re I remember thinking, nah, that's just a weird thing to say. But th this morning I, I felt that fully. I hadn't been out of my bed in a couple of days. And I asked the first service to do this. I'll ask you to do that too. My, my voice is weary. And so if you guys could double your amount of singing and carry some water. That'd be really great this morning. We still got Paige. We got her beautiful, lovely voice, but if you could do that for me, that would really help. Yeah, yeah right. Um, so the Lord's made me a watcher on the wall. I, I just always seem to keep my eyes on the horizon and I always seem to maybe do that a little too much. And uh, this is what we believe as believers, and it's important that we really hunker down in this because it's not just something that we say, but we believe that the Lord has the victory already. And it's very, very difficult for me to believe that in the last couple years, I see things that torment my mind and disrupt my peace, and I just wanna change them so badly, and I sure, I'm sure you share some of that. Um, but. But to live like he really has the victory is not only powerful, but it's transformative in how we think about everything. And my hope is that when we sing this song that we look at it as a victory chant, uh, a people who are declaring this despite what we're seeing. There's so many biblical examples of this with Israel. The eyes are seeing a thing, but that is not what's happening.
Yeah, come on. through um, two of the prophets. I've been reading through Isaiah, and I've been reading through Joel. And um, in my quiet time last night with the Lord, um, I was reading in Joel chapter 2. Um, if you haven't read Joel before, uh, Joel is prophesying to the Israelites, and he's, he's telling them that a great um, judgment from the Lord is going to come, that he's calling them to repentance and saying, uh, the day of the Lord is at hand, repent come back to your first love. Um, and in this story, in, in this book, the Israelites do, they do come back to the Lord um, and they repent of putting other idols in, in front of the Lord. And that just reminded me of my own life. What have I been putting before the Lord? What have I been making more important than he is? And what things in my life and sins in my life am I hiding? not thinking that the Lord will see. And um, when I was reading through Joel chapter 2, verses 12 through 14, it says, this is what the Lord says. Turn to me now while there is still time. Give me your hearts. Come with fasting and weeping and mourning. Don't tear your clothing in grief, but instead tear your hearts. Return to the Lord your God, for he is merciful and compassionate. He is slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. And this is the line that gets me. He is eager to relent and not punish. God is a, a God of grace and mercy, but he's also a God of judgment. I don't think we talk about that enough. While, while we were still cr sinners, Christ died for us. And the wages of sin is death. But God in his mercy, he loved us. He saw us, even though we had sin, even though I have sin in my life, and I have to repent for that, he still died for us. I, I hope that you know when you read scripture, scripture is a mirror. It shows us what we need to change, what we need to submit to the Lord, what I need to submit to the Lord. And when I read that, it says he's eager to forgive and not to punish. God is longing for us to come to him we're holding on to things in our lives that are strongholds, that are idols, and we need to release those for the day of the Lord is coming and we must be ready. So church, as we sing this next song, it's called Christ Be Magnified. Let this be a cry of your heart. Let this convict you or edify you in whatever way, but don't hold back from the Lord. Repent for the kingdom is coming. Let us be ready when it is here. Were creation suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry? Then from north and south and east and west, we'd hear Christ.
puts me in the fire, then I'll rejoice cause you're there too. I won't be formed by feelings, I'll hold fast to what is true. And if the cross brings transformation, then I'll be crucified with you. Cause death is just a doorway into everlasting life. And if I join join me in a word of prayer this morning. Holy Spirit, come and have your way in our service today. Father God, thank you for your son. We magnify his name. We will sing his praises forever. Father, I just pray over our body today that you would release a fresh revelation of the cross of Jesus Christ and everything that it's paid for. I pray that, I pray that, pray Father, that you would remove scales or confusion or any blocks that we've had for seeing him rightly. And Lord, we just repent for ourselves and, and, and for, for everyone that, that hasn't seen you rightly. We know you are a king. We know you sit on a throne. We know that your eyes are fire and that you spend your days now interceding for us. He was the fourth man in a fire, but God's not a respecter of persons. So for everyone here today, Lord, that sees fire in their lives, put it in their heart deep that you are in it with them. Jesus is in it with them. Lord, bring us to a deeper awareness of everything you've paid for. We, we, we repent of... We repent of not seeing what you've done. We repent of negative confessions or elevating experience above your word. Lord, forgive us for our flesh, but awaken our spirit more and more and more as the days go by. Father, I just ask you to send ministering angels right now to the people who need healing, to the people who are hurting, to the people who need deliverance in our body, in this room, in the building, those online even our family at home that didn't make it today. I thank you for your love for us. I thank you for your love to minister to us. And every, every blessing we have, we thank you, Jesus. Father, help us stay focused on you. The world wants us to get distracted. They want us to think a million things, but none of them are you. They want us, they, they turn on a, TV and they'll tell you that the church is whatever it is. It's, it's out, it's going, it's whatever. But Jesus, Jesus' word said, my church will be established and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And Father, we say make us that church. Make us that church. Make us the church that is humble and moldable, but also bold and courageous for you, Lord. We'd all love to see you today. But Lord, you said occupy till I come. So Lord, help us occupy in your eyes 
in your moment, step with you, never ahead, never behind. So I thank you, Lord, for this body, this congregation, everyone in our building, our family online. And Lord, I just pray for a supernatural joy to come over them and a peace, regardless of what's going on around, and that our faith rises to know who our king is and what he's already done, and that the battle's already won, and he's in every fire with us, and nothing will overtake us. I bless your congregation today in Jesus' name. And everyone said? You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It is wonderful to be with y'all here this morning. My name is Ted. I'm one of the pastors here on staff at Encounter. Uh, and if you're here for the first time this morning, first of all, welcome. It is so good to have you here. Uh, or maybe you missed last week, uh, but we are in the second week of our series, uh, Can I Ask That? And I just want to give just a little bit of overview of what this series is. Uh, so back in November, we sent out cards and we just said, y'all ask questions. Whatever question is on your mind, God, society, the world, Jesus, prayer, you name it, whatever, you ask. And in January and the first week of February, we're going to take those questions one at a time and we're going to answer it using the lens of Scripture because the Word of God is alive. And it is so amazing how much truth we can gain, especially on these questions, just by studying it, by reading it. It is just beautiful what God has created. And so if you missed last week and you want to catch up, it's online. Please feel free to go back and watch it. We covered three questions last week, and we're going to cover three more questions this week. Uh, and just, I'm going to say this again, it's a lot of information to go over. And so if you're just like, I don't know if I can follow all of that, that's okay. Just pick one question that interests you and maybe really zone in on that. And the other ones you can go back and you can rewatch it again later. But this is just our way to be able to think through things in a biblical way. And it's so important that we do this when we have questions. Questions are good. Let's answer them biblically. All right, so we're going to jump into three questions. Without any further ado, we're going to jump right into it. And these are questions from all different spectrums. I try to pick ones that aren't all connected, they, and so I, I pick from different categories here. Uh, and so here is the first question that we're going to address this morning. It has to do with prayer. This is the question. Do we pray to Jesus or our Father? It's a great question, and I love answering questions about prayer, because prayer is critical. For the, for the Christ follower, prayer is our way of communicating with God. It's our way of intercessing for other people. It's our way of hearing from God, of allowing our hearts to be changed. It's a form of worship. It is critical in the life of a Christ follower, and so it's a good idea to ask these questions and to get into them biblically. So who do we direct our prayers to? What does scripture say about this? And the reality is scripture absolutely speaks into this question. I'm just going to answer it right off the bat, and then we're going to break down the answer with the rest of this question here. So here's just the uh, uh, immediate answer to this question. We pray to the Father through the power of the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. And this is a great Trinitarian model when it comes to prayer. And here's how we get to this biblically. How do we get there? Well, let's talk about the whole concept of praying to the Father. Well, in Matthew 6, 9, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. And this is how he begins instructing them. He says, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And so clearly, this is an example where Jesus specifically instructs his disciples by praying to the Father. Well, what about another example? Well, when Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, right before his trial and his execution, he knows what's coming, and he is, he is distraught. There, I mean, he's praying sweat drops of blood, and, and this is 
his prayer in Gethsemane, in Matthew, 20, in Matthew 26, he prays this. He says, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass for me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Another example. Or in Matthew 6, 5. Jesus gives us this instruction. He says, when you pray, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That's all the reward they will ever get. But when you pray, go away by yourself, shut the door behind you, and pray to your Father in private. And then your Father, who sees everything, will reward you. Now, there are many other examples that we could give, but why do we say we pray to the Father? Well, that's how Jesus instructs us. That's how we see it in Scripture. Okay, but then what about the second part of that? Why do you say we pray in the power of the Holy Spirit? What does that even mean? And Where do we see this understanding biblically? Well, when Jesus was about to ascend into heaven, he promised his disciples that he was going to send another advocate, the Holy Spirit, to be with them, to live with them. And in John 14, 16, he says this, and I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. And he is the Holy Spirit who leads you into all truth. Now this Holy Spirit, he has come and he has dwelt within each and every one of us who have placed our faith in Jesus Christ. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit does is revealed to us by Paul in Romans 8, 26 through 27. It reveals that the Holy Spirit helps us in our prayers. This is what it says. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father who knows all hearts knows what the Spirit is saying. For the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. Or... In Ephesians 2.18, it says this, Now all of us can come to the Father through the same Holy Spirit because of what Christ has done for us. That's almost word for word with the structure that we provided at the very beginning. And so clearly, the Holy Spirit does lots of things, but one of them is absolutely that he helps us in our need when it comes to prayer. And this is why we can say we pray through the power and the leading and the prompting of the Holy Spirit because he is with us, living with us and inside of us. Well, what about the third aspect of this? You say we're supposed to pray in the name of Jesus. Well, why do we do that? Well, because it's biblical. John 16, Jesus is speaking with his disciples about his death and his subsequent resurrection, and they are not getting it. They're very confused about what Jesus is talking about. But within that conversation, Jesus says this. In verses 22 through 24, again in John uh, chapter 16, Jesus says, So you have sorrow now, but I will see you again. Then Then you will rejoice. And no one can rob you of that joy. And at that time, you won't need to ask me for anything. I tell you the truth, you will ask my Father directly. And he will grant your request because you use my name. You haven't done this before. Ask using my name. And you will receive and you will have abundant joy. Now, friends, this is one of those verses that when we read it, we need to really take the time to grasp exactly what Jesus is saying and what he isn't saying. Clearly, he says to ask in his name. But here is something that he isn't saying. He is not saying... That simply ending your prayers with, in Jesus' name, is some kind of special formula to guarantee that God is going to answer whatever it is that you just prayed for. Like he's some kind of cosmic gumball machine, and if you say the right thing at the end, it's kind of like putting your quarter in, and out comes exactly what it is that you prayed for. No, honestly, can you even just like take a minute and imagine the chaos that would ensue if everybody's prayers that were always prayed came true? Like I know, for example, in my life growing up, if I had received everything that I prayed for, (laughs) My life would be a mess. Like just, oh my word, in fourth grade, it's just like, yeah, that girl's really cute. I really like her. Please, Lord, let me marry her. Whew, all right. Thank God that he doesn't answer prayers like that and that he is God and he knows best. That is clearly not what Jesus is saying here. But what is he saying? What is he saying here? Well, he's saying that when we pray, We should pray in a way that is in alignment with who he is. That we align ourselves with him. 
with his, with his authority to his heart, and we submit to his will, our will to his, and that we can come directly to the Father because of what Christ has done. Scripture tells us that he is our high priest. He intercedes for us. We can go directly to the Father because of what Jesus did. It is just a beautiful illustration that Scripture gives us about this. Now, I want to clarify just a couple things because that might bring up questions. And when, I was, when I was growing up, uh, I, I learned to pray this way. This was the way I was taught. It was, you know, you close your eyes, you fold your hands, and you begin by saying, Dear Jesus... Da, 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 whatever you want to say. And, and so people might be sitting there and you're thinking like, well, that's how I was taught as well. Ted, are you trying to tell me that it's incorrect to begin my prayers by praying to Jesus? And friends, no, that's not what I'm saying. And the reason I'm not saying that is because it's also biblical to pray to Jesus. We have an example of this. In Acts, I need to find my place here because I'm getting all off. Oh, there we go. In Acts, chapter 7, verse 59, when Stephen is being martyred for his faith, he's the first martyr of the faith, this is what he prays. Listen carefully. He says, and as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. And there are other examples of this as well. And so no, I, I wouldn't say it's wrong to pray to Jesus. And honestly, when I'm in prayer, there are times when I directly address the Holy Spirit as well, and, and, and I do it in a way that Scripture reveals is his role. If I'm in like a really tough spot and I'm like, I don't know what to do right now, I, I have no clue, it is, it is like full stop, Holy Spirit, please give me wisdom. You promised that you would reveal truth to me from the Father, and I need that now. Please give me wisdom, give me strength, give me more of the fruits of the Spirit that is just evidence of you in my life. And so I pray in accordance with what Scripture reveals about the Holy Spirit, but no, I don't think it's incorrect to address the various members of the Trinity, but I, I just want to say at the beginning of, I said, gave a structure, and biblically, that is a really good structure for us to pray, but hopefully, that provides at least some insight into that question. Whoever asked that question, great question. It's a wonderful opportunity to teach about prayer. Now, we're going to jump to our second question. Like I said, I, I'm trying to jump to all kinds of different topics. And so here's the second question that we're going to address here this morning. Where do non-Christians go when they die? <laughs> Friends, when this question is asked, or questions like this are asked, they can often evoke a very visceral response. Sometimes you can feel yourself tensing up. And, and, and I, I say that because I've experienced that in my own life growing up. And what I want to say is when we encounter questions like this, I think there's a really important response to it. First of all, whew, take a deep breath. <laughs> That's a good start. But then we need to go to the word of God to address what it says about this question. So that's exactly what we're going to do this morning. Now here's a really important place to start when addressing this particular question. Romans 3, 23 tells us this. For everyone has sinned and we all fall short of God's glorious standards. Romans 6, 23 says this, for the wages of sin is death. And in Ephesians 2, 1 through 3, Paul lays this out so clearly. He says this. He says, once you were dead, because of your disobedience and your many sins, you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world, obeying the devil, the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. And all of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger just like everyone else. And the point that's being made here is that all of us are deserving of death because of our sins. We all deserve to spend eternity separated from Christ in hell. For those are the rightful wages of our sin. Now, somewhere along the line, our world, our society has gotten this mixed up because the overwhelming feedback that I hear from the world and the society just from various conversations and things that are said is that we are, as humans, generally good people. We do more good than we do bad, and therefore the assumption is that at the end of our lives, when our time on this earth is over, we're heading to a better place. And friends, I can absolutely understand why this has become the default understanding for so many. 
because it sounds really comforting. It's a really nice thought. It's encouraging to hear. And as a society, we really like things that make us feel good. But there is a huge problem with this. Namely, it's in direct opposition to what Scripture teaches. We just saw that in Romans and in Ephesians and many other passages that I didn't read this morning. They say the same thing. Scripture clearly states that our default destination is not heaven. Because of our sins and our trespasses, our default destination is eternal separation from God in hell. And I rightfully deserve this. I am a sinner. Me, Ted Simmons, I deserve God's judgment for all the wrong that I have done. Friends, sin is no laughing matter, and this is the truth for all of us. But, and boy, this next part is so good. That is not where scripture ends talking about this topic. With that as our background, with that as like the, the, the reality of the situation, listen to the picture that Paul paints in Romans chapter 5. He provides us with such a beautiful insight and hope, and this is what he says. In chapter 6 through 11, he says, or in verses 6 through 11, he says, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who's especially good, but God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from God's condemnation. For, our, for since our friendship with God was restored by the death of his son while we were still his enemies, he will certainly be saved through the life of his son. So now we can rejoice in a wonderful new relationship with God because our Lord Jesus Christ has made us friends of God. And to that I say amen. Again, in Ephesians 2, we read 1 through 3, but then Paul continues it into 4 through 6. And this is how he continues what he said. We were all sinners. He, he admits that. And then he says, but God is so rich in mercy. He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. And it's only by God's grace that we have been saved. For he raised us up from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms because we are united with Christ Jesus. Friends, I, wanna, I want you to hear this. On Christmas Eve, if you were here, I spoke about this. This was like the brief message that was given. But the whole point of the message was all about invitations. We have all received an invitation to place our faith in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior and to live our lives for him and allow his sacrifice to pay the price, to pay the cost for our sins. And if we accept this invitation, Scripture goes on to explain in great detail all of the promises that are given to us. We are now reborn into the family of God. We are sealed with his Holy Spirit. We are guaranteed eternal life with God forever and eternity. And friends, this is such good news. But here's the thing. The choice to, of this is ours to make. You see, God doesn't send people to hell. In fact, he went to ridiculous extremes to provide us with a way out. But he will allow us to make that choice for ourselves. Now, Revelation clearly states the outcome for those who do not accept this invitation that is freely given to everyone. Scripture says he loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. But this also directs, directly answers the question, the second question that was asked this morning. Just read with me what John says in Revelation 20, 11 through 15. This is what he says. He says, and I saw a great white throne and the one sitting on it. And the earth and the sky fled from his presence, but they found no place to hide. I saw the dead, both great and small, standing before God's throne, and the books were open, including the book of life. And the dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up its dead, and death and the grave gave up their dead, and all were judged according to their deeds. And then death and the grave were thrown into the lake of fire, and this lake of fire is the second death. And anyone whose name was not found recorded in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Friends, this is our choice. It's fully laid out in the word of God for all of us to see. And while we are on this earth, we have chance after chance after chance after chance to put our faith in Jesus Christ. But if we choose not to do that, scripture's very clear on the destination. 
But if we choose, if we choose to place our faith in Jesus, eternity with him is promised because it's only through faith in Jesus that we can be saved. And friends, if you have never made that choice, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I, I feel very led to do this right now. If you have never made that choice to place your faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I encourage you, don't wait. You can do that right now in your seat where you are sitting, at home where you are sitting. It doesn't matter where you are, just don't wait any longer. And I'm gonna offer a prayer in just a second, but please know it's not about saying specific words. It's not about a, a specific prayer. It's about a heart change. It's about a desire to declare him as our Lord and Savior, Jesus, and to live our lives for him. For scripture says in John 1, 12 through 13, but to all who believed in him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. They're reborn. Not with a physical birth resulting from human passion or plan, but a birth that comes from God. So what that means is we need to believe and to receive what he has done for us. And if you make that decision today, first off, praise God. Second off, don't keep it to yourself. Friends, this is good news. It's not something to be embarrassed about. This is something to proclaim. Tell the person you're sitting next to. If this is what you, if this is what you decide today, or talk to someone on the worship team or the staff team or the prayer ministry team, find me after the service and tell me. Send us an email this week, however you choose to tell us, please do, so that we can walk with you as a church body in this journey because it is truly, truly an important step to take. But if you would, and if you feel inclined, please, would you just bow your head, pray this prayer with me. Father God, thank you for who you are. Thank you for sending Jesus. Thank you for the, his work on the cross for my sins. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Father, today I acknowledge Jesus as my Lord and my Savior. I want to place my faith in him. Please help me to become more and more like him all the days of my life. And in the powerful name of Jesus, I pray these things. Amen. Amen. And if you prayed that, please tell someone. Don't just keep that to yourself. All right, let's jump to the last question. I have four minutes. <laughs> Something about four minutes. All right. This one's quicker than last week, though. This is a really fun question, and it's a completely different topic than the first two. Here's the question. The Lord asks for sacrifices and offerings on certain days or even before entering his holy spaces. And these sacrifices of animals and grain offerings were not small. As I read it, were not cheap. So how did the poor people fare, as I'm sure there must have been plenty that couldn't do this? I love this question. I love reading the Old Testament, so that's part of it, because this deals primarily with the Old Testament and the law system from the Old Testament. But by studying this, we are given a glimpse into the character of God and how he cares about everybody, because this question is answered beautifully for us in Scripture. Here's some background. The Israelites had been slaves in Egypt. 400 years they were in bondage. God sent Moses, Moses delivered them through the Red Sea into the wilderness, and they are finally free. They are a free people. However, they don't know how to be a people. They just spent 400 years in slavery. They don't have any laws, they don't have any customs, they don't have any leadership structures, they have nothing, a blank slate. Actually, a little bit less than a blank slate, because what they do bring into the wilderness is familiarity with, with uh, pagan worship practices and idolatry and that kind of stuff. And we see that materialize almost immediately with the whole golden calf fiasco. And so what God has to do is kind of break them of that, but also provide them with structure, which is exactly what he does through the Old Testament law. This is how you will be my people. This is how you will represent me, and I will be your God. Okay, so back to this question. In Leviticus 1 through 7, we encounter this whole idea of offerings and sacrifices, and we encounter five different offerings in these chapters. Here are the five. I'm just going to say them out loud. We have burnt offerings, grain offerings, peace offerings, purification, or sometimes it's called sin offerings, and guilt offerings. Now, I don't have time to get into all of them, but just know this. They're all extremely important but they all deal with various aspects of life. They're not all the same thing. They're very specific, but they do require the people to give up something of value, something that they needed to live, whether it was something from their herds or their flocks, or maybe it was their crops, or maybe it was money. Whatever it might be, they were required to give something up to the Lord. 
And so, how did the question that we were asking about, how did the really poor people do this? How are they, how are they able to afford all these sacrifices? And the answer is, God worked financial means into the system that he created. It is absolutely beautiful to see how he did this. And there's a beautiful example of this from the New Testament. Check this out with me. It's actually Jesus' family, specifically, that we see this exemplified. In Luke chapter 2, verses 21 and 22, and then verse 24, let's just read what happens. So this is what it says. Eight days later, when the baby was circumcised, he was named Jesus. And then when it was time for their purification offering, as required by the law of Moses after the birth of a child, so his parents took him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. And so they offered the sacrifice required in the law of the Lord, either a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. That's where the verse ends. Now, we could easily read that verse and just skip right over it and keep going on because what in the world does that mean? And I, I would imagine that frequently we do that because we don't have a detailed understanding of Leviticus. But if you would have a detailed understanding of Leviticus, you realize that that passage reveals that Jesus' parents, Mary and Joseph, were not wealthy. Let's go back to Leviticus. Chapter 12, verses 6 through 8, we read this about the offering that Mary was bringing that day. This is what it says in 6 through 8. When the time of purification is completed for either a son or a daughter, the woman must bring a one-year-old lamb for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a purification offering. These are the instructions for a woman after the birth of a son or a daughter. But if a woman cannot afford to bring a lamb, she must bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. One will be for the burnt offering and the other will be for the purification offering. So friends, what this means is Mary and Joseph didn't have the financial means to provide a lamb for the sacrifice. Ironic, isn't it? They couldn't provide a lamb, but of course Jesus was the perfect lamb to take away the sins of the world. And so instead of offering a lamb, they offered two birds, which was allowed by the law of God for those that couldn't afford it. And the last thing that I'm going to say on this is, is, this, is it, this comes, and I encourage you, go read this. It's Leviticus 4 and 5. It's another discussion about the purification offering or the sin offering. You go read this for yourself, but there's tears. It goes through like six different things. It says, if the high priest sins, you need to offer a bull. The bull needs to be the sacrifice. If the people of Israel as a community sin, a bull needs to be offered as a sacrifice. If a leader within the people sins, you need to offer a goat. If a common person sins, it's a sheep. But if you can't afford a sheep, you can offer two birds, two doves, two turtle doves, or two pigeons. But if you can't afford two birds, you may offer two quarts of flour. And you see through this that God provides a way for everyone, absolutely everyone, to participate in the structures that he laid down. And what this reveals to us is that God cares about everyone, particularly the poor. He didn't have to add that into the law, but he does because he knows his people and he wants to be able to give them something that they can offer as a worship and a sacrifice, but it's something that they're able to be able to offer and all of it is accepted, and it is just absolutely beautiful, and again, we see that with Jesus. In the New Testament, the structures that he laid down are for everyone to be able to participate in salvation, and friends, this just shows that God knows and works these things into his law, and it is just absolutely beautiful, and friends, I'm just gonna, that's, that's the end of our questions for today. I'm going to wrap up with this. My encouragement, my challenge is we get these answers by reading scripture, by reading God's word, and my encouragement to you is do that. <laughs> get into the word of God. Continue to read it. We're two weeks into the new year, and I imagine some of us were like, I'm going to read God's word, and two weeks in, we're like, wow, this is really hard to set a time every day. That's okay. If you don't do it every day, that's okay, but just don't give up. 
Stay true and stay in God's word because it is so important. It is living and it is active and it is just critical for us in answering these questions. Don't give up. Keep at it for the word of God is true. And we'll see you back next week as we dive into more questions from this series. Please pray with me. Father God, thank you so much for your goodness. Thank you for the details that you provide in Scripture and and the ability that you've given us to answer them. Lord, you care about these details and you have provided answers to them for us. Father, my prayer is that we would continue to live our lives for you. Our prayer is that we would continue to be lights in this world, representatives of you and Jesus. Father, thank you so much that you sent him to die for our sins. And in the powerful name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. Church family, if you're able, would you stand?
Thank you all for joining us. Um, it's been a pleasure worshiping with you. Um, before we head out, I just wanted to remind everybody of Ted's challenge, which was to continue reading the word of God. And if you have questions, I encourage you to seek them out um, yourself in scripture. Um, but as always, you can always ask questions and lean on your brothers and sisters. Um, and before we go, I have two quick announcements. Um, first is to your right, you'll see the prayer banner at the end of the stage. We have a prayer team here, um, and they would love to pray for you and with you. So if you came in this morning um, with a heavy heart, um, there's someone, there's something that you would like someone to pray with you about, um, definitely stop by there. And lastly, um, behind me on the screen will be the ways to give. Um, you can also um, give in the drop boxes on the way out if you came prepared to give today. Um, but we just want to say thank you for your generosity in your giving um, because it all goes back to the Lord and we do our best to steward it and um, it goes into the ministries here at Encounter to reach the community and serve people and um, ultimately just glorify the Lord. So thank you um, for your generosity. Uh, thank you for being here and we look forward to doing it again next week.